Well, welcome everyone to this month's Office 365 Productivity Tips, the March Madness. Completely original. We had it first, pretty sure. Wow, I, I just, I've never heard those words put together like that. I think it's the only March Madness that's happening this month, though, so. Actually, you got a good point. This is the, <laughs> I'm not sure you planned it that way, but if you uh, want Mar March no. Madness, this is your only shot. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, just uh, some real quick introductions here. Fiddle forward. There we go. My name is Christian Buckley, founder and CEO of Collab Talk. I'm based in Lehigh, Utah, so just uh, uh, 45 minutes south of Salt Lake City. It's kind of the tech hub of Utah here, it's called, lovingly referred to as Silicon Slopes. And so I literally, <laughs> I walk outside and I can see, uh, I can see the building with Microsoft and Oracle and Adobe and all, all just uh, five minutes away from my house here. Uh, I've been in uh, Microsoft MVP for uh, eight and a half, nine years, whatever it is now. I'm also a regional director and I love talking about productivity, end user and power user productivity tips. So these things that we're gonna be sharing are all no code, maybe some configuration. There's always an administrator involved to enable a lot of this stuff. <laughs> Not all of it, some of it's out of the box. Um, but uh, that's me and you can find my blog out on Buckley Planet. And I'm here with Tom, hello. That would be me. <clears throat> and much like Christian, I work with Office 365 stuff all day long. I have a, a website, One Minute Office Magic, which is where I store a lot of these uh, productivity tips in the Office 365 realm. Work for a health insurance company in the Pacific Northwest, even though I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So I'm just uh, <clears throat> doing the remote thing like everybody else is. Of course, I do that all the time. It doesn't make a difference, but uh, just cranking out new tips and sharing them with the world. And good stuff. And most of what we you, you'll see today, um, we Tom and I do try to blog about this stuff. It, well, Tom's been doing it for a long time. I've been trying to get better about going and writing more expanded blog posts on it. So definitely, if you like what you see, check out both of those. Now, we also do uh, keep score. Now, as you can see, the leaderboard Ooh. on the right, Tom is in charge on all three. So and we actually had a tie last time. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, but we're, uh, yeah, it, that, that fell off with, uh, with last month. Um, so it was Tom, Tom, and then a tie. Um, but you know, what's amazing is that here's now our, we've done it live two times, three times together. I think three times. Three or four. Yeah. Yeah. Four, I think. Um, yeah. Vegas doesn't count though, because we were doing a best of. Well, we were doing a best of until you prompted and said, well, well we're going to yeah. do a best of head to head. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, but anyway, so we had, oh, that's right. There it is in the score, 522-2019. That's right. I did that. <laughs> but um, you know, but what's amazing, if you look at the total the tallies, of, here will be our 20th, and uh, that was my, those are my dogs. You might hear. Nothing I can do, people. Sorry. Um <laughs> But uh, uh, how close it has been over the almost three years that we've been doing these, uh, these events. So that's pretty cool. Uh, just an overview of how we run these very quickly, the rules of engagement. So we're going to go through, we're going to take turns. Tom and I are going, we have five rounds uh, where we're going head to head. We don't know what the other person is presenting. So Tom might present on PowerPoint. I might present on OneNote. And then the audience then votes of which do you think is, is, the, is the tip that you find most productive, like you would actually go and use. And I'm just going to say this up front this time, no sympathy votes. No. And I, and I also, I, I realize there's a lot of people from Tom's company that are here. Um, any threats that Tom makes against you that if you don't vote for him, he won't fix your problems. He, he can't do that. I know his manager. I, so. <laughs> I don't consider that a threat. I consider that as an enhancement inducer that may get their <laughs> stuff fixed more quickly. Oh, is that, is that part of the SLA? <laughs> mm, could be. <laughs> so we also, we don't duplicate. So because Tom and I don't know what each other's going to present, there is a chance, and it's happened twice, right. where one of us is presenting on uh, what the, well, like my number one item is his number three item. And so we have backups. 
I, I've got two backups that are not fully formed slides, but just in case. Okay, that's scary. Yeah. <coughs> um, audience votes after each round, so we'll launch short polls. Always say this, no hitting below the belt. And I'm Tom sure always he says. always hits below the belt, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, we have the winner. That, that person gets to uh, um, talk smack to the other person for an entire month. So it's uh, pretty rewarding. It's not happened to me in a while. but uh, <laughs> Well, we'll see if we can fix that this month. Yeah. All right, well, let's jump right into things. And the sooner I get through this, the and Tom starts talking, then I can go uh, uh, sort out the dogs. So, though, though I must laugh about the dogs because I was just on another recording prior to this, and the person told me that they had done a quick one-and-a-half-minute recording of something that they were going to distribute out, and they didn't notice that the recliner was in the background and the dog was sitting there. So, like, the first 20 seconds – the dog was really interested in what was going on in the screen because the dog could see the owner in the whole bit. And then the dog got distracted by licking his own body parts <laughs> in which the person said, I really don't think I suddenly, can use this video now. <laughs> yeah, suddenly, well, you can obfuscate that. <laughs> I basically told him that would be viral material that would be hilarious. right there. That's all there is to it. <laughs> and then you have the PG-13 version, which you release on the DVD only. That's Pixelated right. there on the corner. <laughs> yeah. All right. Go for it. Let's jump into it. So here's a simple one, but it's a nice little new, newer feature. If you've not seen it yet, if you're using Microsoft Teams, is pinning your apps to the left-hand rail in Teams. Uh, so Microsoft has done a lot of things uh, to, to improve the navigation the usability in Teams. Some of the earliest comments that I heard from people were like, look, it's too much. We see this flood of the creation of Teams and all these channels and all the messaging that's out there. Uh, and so some of the initial questions in year one of Teams, uh, the launch of Teams, uh, were like, well, how do I go in an archive? How do I uh, shut the stuff down? How do I remove all these things? And the danger of, of removing things entirely is then, well, then you don't have access to them. You can't use them and collaborate with them. But you need to have a, uh, a streamlined or cleaned uh, workspace so that you can be more efficient and focus on those things. So Microsoft has done things like uh, they've gone in and they've improved search and the filtering and search, which we've not talked about, Tom. We, one of us needs to maybe do that. Okay. Um, just talk about search inside of Teams. Um, adding or deselecting channels and Teams as favorites so that they disappear from your view. So out of sight, out of mind. If you're not involved with it, you don't need to see it cluttered up only favorite the items where you're actually in working. You're not, again, losing access, they're still there. Or pinning channels, that was fantastic addition here uh, a couple months ago. And now you can pin apps. So if you have a personal app that you're leveraging a lot, um, so I'm using this example, um, good friend of ours, uh, Matt Wade, fellow MVP, uh, who is at his product uh, AppBot, very useful. Um, but there's a number of tools that are out there uh, and you can pin that now to the left rail. So maybe you're using, uh, if you're a Trello user or even planner, and you can add the planner, even though we know tasks in Teams is coming, that's all been announced. Um, but you can pin that relevant uh, app to the way that you work. So how that works, uh, oh, and I should mention that admins can actually go in and set policies. So you can actually set and say, well, I want, Let's say if you're using Planner or if you're using your know, MS Project or whatever you know, across the organization, the admin can go in and say everyone will have this app pinned to the left nav because it's it's our standard. Um, but to to add an app, it's really simple. You go down and you click on the ellipses there on the right. And that opens up this dialog box, and you'll see you know, the most frequently used or most recently used apps. Of course, you can click on the more apps and get to everything that's within your environment. And again, as an admin can go in and determine, hey, it, it, like if you're unable to add an app, talk to your admin about this. Uh, you know, have that added into your system. The, uh, the team owner can also determine uh, apps that are allowed or, or not allowed within that space. But it's really simple. Just go in and uh, you know, select the app. Um, and 
uh, sorry, just it sounds like uh, it. My wife is handling the dogs. Excellent. <laughs> um, so select the app and you know, click on it and either click, click save or double click on it and it will then uh, add it to the left rail. You see at bot added. And you also see an interaction there. So this, it just jumps into that, uh, that app or bot experience. In this case, the at bot. Um, if it's like if I'm adding, um, like I used Adobe Cloud and there's actually some it shows some of the history and some of the different settings that you can do within that experience uh, so there's just uh, it, it'll it'll pop up there now you can also then go in and remove uh, to remove it from that view you s just uh, uh, select pin and when you move away from that app it'll disappear from the left nav you can also go in if you're the admin the team admin and you can block that app so sometimes that, you know, if you go in and you're, you're using a right, wait, this isn't what I thought it was, or this is sending if it's, you know, in my organization, I'm, I'm the only employee, so I'm not worrying about uh, so much about what people are doing in the system because it's just me. I sometimes worry about what I'm doing in the system, but not generally. Uh, but you can go in and say, well, this app is it's sending data outside. It's not approved through a compliance. And so you can block in entirely um, or right from this little menu, as you can see, you can uninstall the app entirely. But just to remove it from the view, it's just a simple unpin. And that's it. Pin your app to the left-hand rail. Yeah, I I know that it's out there. I haven't played with this one yet, though, because we don't generally allow a lot of third-party things out there. But uh, this is definitely something that I'm curious as to how it might help our environment. So good new, good stuff. Okay, so on mine, I'm going to talk about enhanced meeting scheduling in Microsoft Teams. So surprisingly, we have a Teams versus Teams thing going on here, which is kind of nuts. So one of the complaints about Microsoft Teams when it comes to meetings is that it didn't, and in some cases still doesn't, have quite the same feature parity as you would get setting up an Outlook meeting. Well, now just recently, they've come up with enhanced meeting scheduling. And so there's a few new features that I really like because they're ones that I generally use in most of the meetings I schedule and now I can actually use them in Teams. So the first one is when you schedule a new meeting, <clears throat> you have the option to have required and optional attendees instead of just putting a list of people in there and the people are like, I don't know what this is for. Do I really need to attend this? Now you can do the same optional type meeting scheduling that you would do in Outlook. The other thing that I like, too, is that you have the ability to go to an all-day meeting format. So if you are doing something that's going to be like 8 to 5, or it's just like a midnight to midnight thing for something that you want to have on your calendar, you can actually set that up now, too, by just indicating that it's going to be a full day. Um, the other thing that's kind of cute, and it's a little subtle, but it's kind of nice, is that if you select somebody to be invited to a meeting, if their name is outlined in pink or red, as you see here, that actually means that they're not available for that time slot. So it makes it very nice to easily be able to see when there's a scheduling conflict without you having to go to the uh, scheduling assistant and figure out what's going on there. However, there still is a scheduled um, uh, scheduling assistant that you can, there we go. Uh, that you can use now. So if you go to the scheduling assistant tab at the top of the screen of your meeting, you can see where you have your required attendees and your optional attendees. It will tell you in red whether that person's available or unavailable. So it doesn't have quite the same, hey, go pick the next time type feature, but at least you now have something that allows you to see meeting availability, um, attendee availability from within a Microsoft Teams calendar meeting that you're scheduling, which is nice. And because I had set this up as an all-day meeting, it now appears up in the upper portion of my calendar rather than, you know, something that stretches down the entire length of my calendar. So it's treated much the same as like if I note that Sandra has a PTO day coming up, it would normally appear up here in the top as an all day event. So there's some equity now there in how meeting and event situations 
show up in your team's calendar, much like they would show up in your Outlook calendar. <clears throat> One other thing that's kind of nice too, is that once you have that meeting created, this meeting puts some of the common tabs up at the top that you'd wanna see, such as the meeting details, meeting notes, so it's gonna hook into your OneNote, and it's also gonna give you a quick and easy way to get to the whiteboard. So again, it consolidates a lot of those features that you're gonna to wanna to be using in a meeting into a single pane that you can easily get to. And if you cancel a meeting, it also gives you the option to say, I'm canceling this meeting, here's the note, here's why. Rather than just it gets canceled and the people that got invited are like, it's canceled, I don't know why it's canceled. Now you've got a way to be able to communicate. So this information or this, these features that they have brought forward into Microsoft Teams starts to really give you a lot of feature parity in what you have in Outlook. And it makes it a little bit more easier to make that mental shift to say, do I wanna create this team or do I wanna create this meeting in Microsoft Teams or do I wanna go out and do it in Outlook because that's how I always do it. So if you get a chance, you know, check out Teams, check out these features and see if it doesn't make your meetings a little bit more equal to what you normally do when you use Outlook to get to the same point. Awesome. You know, and one question I know that people ask is like, well, is this duplicating a lot of stuff in, in Outlook? I don't know if you've had that question and how you answer that, Tom. Um, <clears throat> I haven't had that question. I don't think it duplicates anything. I think it just makes it easier for you to be able to go in and see hey, I, you know, I want to create this meeting out in Teams, but it's going to show up on both of your calendars. So it's going to show up in an Outlook calendar. It's going to show up in your Teams calendar because those two are synchronized with each other. So right. it's not like, oh, I've got it in one calendar, but not in the other. They're in both, but now you can actually schedule a Teams meeting as opposed to like a Skype meeting or a regular meeting. And you can do it from over in Teams and have the same kind of availability of features that you really didn't have before. And I think that's the key is that, uh, it, it, so it, right, it's, it's not meant to, you know, replace the use of Outlook. Obviously, Outlook does a lot of other things, but when you're working over in Teams and you're scheduling these meetings and these video chats, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or, or group meetings, and to be able to, just the, the lost productivity of, you know, alt-tabbing, moving between applications, you need to have some basic capabilities and having that additional visibility so you're not having to toggle back and forth with Outlook to find, are these people even available or are they responding or what does my calendar really look like? Um, it's great to have that, that data right there inside of Teams. And so if you didn't see it, you know, the poll is now open. Uh, so you can vote on pinning an app or the enhanced meeting capability. All right, and Tom, you won with 67%. Ooh, okay, good. I can start to breathe now. All right. <laughs> so round two. <clears throat> so round two, I'm going to stick with Teams. Let me put a little dash of planner in there. <clears throat> so this is something that Sandra Mahan, my coworker the other day, uh, found, and we thought, this is rather cool. So we use planner for like a weekly Kanban-style board for the stuff that our uh, overall team is doing. And when she went into Teams after assigning a few, you know, story cards and planner, she found in the chat um, section over here on the left-hand side, there was a new entry for planner, which had never been there before. And when she clicked on it, she saw this new page for planner chat, and it had a lot of different options up at the top that, or investigation there, so the first one that you click on and the one that you go into by default is the chat for planner. And that basically is gonna enter something every time you get a task assigned to you in a planner that you're part of. So it's just gonna be, you know, one entry you see, I had one on February 28th, another one on March 2nd. So this is useful to get notified that somebody's done something to add you to a planner and to expect you to do work, God forbid. Um, but the one that I actually like more is if you click on the My Tasks, <clears throat> the My Task goes through and shows you any task that you are assigned to 
in any of the planners that you're part of. So it groups them into three buckets, the not started, in progress, and completed, which is very similar to the Kanban board style that you uh, have used if you're into Kanban. But this is nice in the fact I don't have multiple places and multiple planners I need to go to to find things that may or may not belong to me. I've got one shot that shows me everything. And I think that's really cool. And you can click on charts and schedules and it gives you pretty graphs and things like that. But I tend to be more text oriented. So seeing these cards in this kind of format works really well for me. Now there is a recent one and then there's an all one that's within that three more item that you see there. I clicked on those and I think what it's supposed to show you is recent tasks across all the planners that you've been part of and all tasks in all the planners that you've been part of. When I tried both of those, I just got the spinning wheel of death that didn't go away after numerous minutes. So I don't know if that wasn't functional or whether it's somehow I'm part of a million planners that I'm not part of. So I really didn't see any usefulness in the recent or the all uh, item that I had up here in the tab portion, but the chat and the my tasks, especially the my tasks is something that's really useful. So again, if you're using teams and you're using planners, I would highly suggest checking out your chat in your team's workspace and see if you have a planner chat, quote unquote, going on and check it out because this is a really great way for you to keep track of what you've got going on. You know, I'll just, I'll add a couple things to this. Uh, so uh, the pinning an app, if you pin planner, so if you're, you are using planner heavily, it essentially gives you that same view. So having that, you know, quick access into that and having all the different options. Nice. So that's just another way rather than having to go over to chat and click on planner that way. Um, you can make it visible from the left, left rail and just cool. uh, pin that app. Um, but you're right. Yeah. You know, what that should show, I'm not sure why it you know, continues to spin on you, but you can if you go into the planner app proper. So rather this slice this view within Teams, but just go into a planner as a standalone, or you can do that at office.com, and you can see a, a other views like the critical path view, for example. Right. Um, so there, there's just, you can go in there and kind of filter data based on person. And, and then the one last thing that I think is excellent that adds on to the My Tasks is if you're using to do so the to do app on your mobile device will show all of these my tasks so everything that you see in to do will show in uh in planner um oh, sorry everything that you see in planner will show in to do <laughs> right. obviously you can have personal tasks and other things that won't be in planner in to do um, but that's just something that if you want a, a, a just another way to consume this information and especially on a mobile device, it's, it's excellent. Cool. There's, a, there's a lot happening, uh, and I'll have to, I'll, I'll, I'll add it into the link into the blog post, but Tom, if you've not blogged about this yet, make sure that you add the video that Caruana shared it in her Coffee in the Cloud in November, which is the future of tasks in Teams. Oh, okay. And so it has this animation which just shows their vision. And there's another, um, you know, the future of tasks video. And I've written about this. I've blogged. I've actually got a blog series over on Buckley Planet um, talking about this. My background, you know, I spent 15 years in, as a project manager. And, and so I'm very passionate about that space. And Microsoft is doing a ton around task management uh, cross workloads. So some exciting stuff happening there. Um, visualizing data with ideas in Excel. If you're like me, I, I, so I use the ideas in PowerPoint extensively. I'm, I'm one of those people that um, I, I just, I look at other people's beautiful PowerPoints and I'm like, who has the time for that? I mean, <laughs> you know, and, and so I would use some of the, uh, the old kind of crappy looking templates that Microsoft provided or or I would steal slide ideas from other people's sessions that I saw that I really like that format. I'm going to download that slide and then modify it for my own. Well, now with, with ideas in PowerPoint, as you're building, it actually comes up with here's a dozen different look and feel difference, and it's all color coordinated, and, and it's just fantastic. And, and I, I remember thinking this with them. I was like, oh, I'd love to see this in Excel and in Word and, 
and other capabilities. Well, now you have that visualization of data inside of Excel. And so it's obviously you're working with uh, your data set there um, to, to get started with it. It's the, the ideas is at the top right, the little lightning strike there. Um, but it, it gives you recommendations of what to do and actually helps you kind of refine your thinking of what you want to go in and present. So it helps you understand your data at that high level and then create those visualizations around the patterns. So to start using it, it's very simple. You select the data set and then you click on ideas. And just like in PowerPoint, what opens up on the right side is that dialog box with based on that data set. And that's a, I just did a very generic, simple data set there but it pulls together these different variations. So you can scroll down through those and like, let's say I, I'm looking at this, I'm saying, well, you know, it doesn't really make sense to try and look at all of that data. I just wanna look at pieces of that data. Uh, and so I can actually go in and kind of filter the view and say, hey, I only wanna focus on like the color uh, as that you know, pivot data point. And so it'll then go in and modify all of the suggested pivot charts based on that subset of data. And so you can thumb through those and say, okay, here's the one that I want and uh, insert the pivot chart. And what happens um, is that it uh, then opens up a new tab. So since I've gone in to refine the data set, it opens up a tab, it identifies the subset of data that I've selected and inserts the chart. Now, obviously I can go in and insert other things, but I can immediately, I can go in and start manipulating the data. I can change the look and feel of the chart, um, turn this into a 3D, turn this into a, uh, you know, a pie chart rather than a graph or a line chart. Um, and so you can really start playing with that subset of data. And, and that's what's great about the ideas in PowerPoint. It's not that it's gonna be perfect, although if you're like me, I often go with what you know, the suggestion that that looks great, good enough, move on. Uh, but this is just a great way to get ideas, be thinking about the visualizations of your data and just better ways of sharing that information. So if you want to learn more about it, of course, I've got the, the, the links to the uh, Microsoft blog post about it as well as videos kind of walks you through and, and shows you the features. But really cool out of the box feature now that uh, everybody should be able to get in the latest versions of Excel. It's interesting as you're presenting that, I thought, ooh, poor man's version of Power BI. <laughs> well, that, and that's the thing. It's, it's, a, it's a jump start into a lot of that stuff. If you're, it really is. That, that's one of the hardest parts of data visualization is like, where do I even get started with that? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what it is I don't know. Right, right. So, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, well, you can have, you know, analytics and you can see things that you've never seen before. It's like, yeah, that's pretty much the starting point for everything I do along this, <laughs> this realm. So I, I need stuff like that to get me started to go, oh, I hadn't thought about doing it that way. So. Well, yeah, I, I remember I, somebody uh, was kind of razzing me over, uh, you know, borrowing the look and feel of their slides for that. I'm just like, look, it was a great design. And then they fessed up that it was a Microsoft person who created it <laughs> and they borrowed air quotes, uh, you know, borrowed the design as well. Um, Actually, and it's the same. Yeah, I was going to say, that's something we call R and D, which is Rob and duplicate. <laughs> that's, <right. laughs> that's funny. I've not heard that, but yeah. Yes. Rob and duplicate. That's awesome. All right. Uh, we'll go uh, five more seconds here on the poll. If you've had a chance, um, yeah, as Catherine says, really hard round to choose. Um, yeah, so I, you know, both really useful. I, that's how I feel about most of these, which is also why in three years we've been, we're, we're a couple dozen votes apart. Right. It's been fairly even and the lead has just gone back and forth is because a lot of these, you know, like we're both torn. We're both, ah, ah that was really good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would have voted for Christians. Hey. <laughs> Well, there you go. Yeah, I'll have permission to vote for me because Tom would have. So, <laughs> all right, I'm going to end the polling there. And uh, yeah, I took it 79 to 21. Very good. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, we're round three. To round three. All right. So this one is a simple uh, one, but I uh, I liked I'd like to see more people doing this. I think it's a great idea. Adding an Office document as a tab in Teams. 
why am I sharing this? They're like, we're, if we're using Teams, you've probably done this. Maybe. Tom, have you done this? Uh, we have done it on a couple occasions, especially during our migration. Yep. In our migration team workspace, there were times where we wanted to put one document that we we're referring to on a regular basis yep. right up front as a tab. Well, I love the scenario of the co-authoring, uh, co-editing, working on it in real time. Uh, and I, so I've got you know, stories of when I was a, a, a young project manager, joined the phone company, and uh, spent my first day frustrated trying to find documentation in our intranet, uh, which if you remember, like 1995 intranets, um, wasn't the fastest thing and was literally going through project binders, three ring binders, uh, trying to find process flows and other documentation. And it was like, just, just sit down with me, point me to it, so I could spend my two hours reading and un consuming information rather than trying to chase and find this thing. Well, just in the scenario, Tom, you just mentioned, you're, you're going to actively be working on something, it's relevant, you want it top of mind, Put it right out front as as a team, as a, as a tab. Sorry for your team, uh, and this applies to any content that's uploaded within Teams. Um, you can navigate between channels and between teams, um, but I'll I'll come back to that from an admin perspective. Um, but to add a, an Office document uh, as a tab, uh, it's really pretty simple. Up at the top there, the uh, the plus mark to add a tab to to open a new tab. And the dialog box opens with all the most recent or, or most used. And you can see from that menu of items, you can see uh, you know, Excel and OneNote and PDF, PowerPoint, Word, um, all those things that you can go in there and add. Of course, a lot of other apps as well. Uh, but in this case, we're talking about Office Docs. I'm going to add uh, a Word. And so when you add that, this dialog box opens. You can select from the Word docs that are there within the current channel, the current team. You can navigate up and look across those channels or look at other teams, as I mentioned. Of course, the thing to remember is that uh, if you know, other people are not members of those other channels or teams, then you share that documentation, then they're going to get a, uh, a, an error message. They're not going to be able to view that content that's being shared necessarily, or it could change um, the, in fact, to look in this scenario, uh, where it actually changed the permissions of the content that you're sharing that you may not want to share. So just be aware of that as you're sharing content. In general, I only share content in the channels and the teams where people have access. If there's uh, another, if there's content that's out on another site, a SharePoint site, team site, for example, I might link to that team, but not add a specific document there um, just so I don't cause those you know, potential security issues with sharing. Always, you know, people are only gonna be able to get to the content that you've given them permissions to, so if you uh, restrict that access to, you must be able to access this team site, uh, then the, if they don't have access, they're not going to be able to see the content within that. Uh, and there is, once you're inside, and this is where it's fantastic, because I love the, the co-authoring, co-editing, when you're sharing it there live, then as people comment, if you turn on revision marks and are adding to it, you're going to see those comments, you're going to see the, you know, in real time. And I, I'm a huge advocate for uh, you know, let's put this shared document up and as we're on, you know, jump on a Teams meeting and uh, we don't need to be on camera. Let's sit here and all stare and compare the document together and make edits in real time as we're creating this content, if that's uh, relevant. So I, I just, uh, I'm a big fan of this. Um, I, I'm an equal fan of, uh, of using OneNote in the same way. Um, just let everybody get in there and work on something at the same time and add their comments, see your edits in real time. It can be difficult sometimes to write under those circumstances, to be the one typing. However, uh, when you're, it's, it's kind of that JAD, RAD, that rapid application development you know, model, that collaborative model where you get everybody input right there in real time. Don't come back, come back and complain that I left out some requirements <laughs> of yours if we were all in the meeting together and you didn't speak up. So. 
exactly. That's it. That's that's my <clears throat> item. That's that's a cool tip. I like that one. Okay, so my round three one is a tip that is kind of a love hate relationship for me. <clears throat> I like it in this, but I don't like it in other places. So Microsoft recently rolled out a new feature for Microsoft Teams, and yes, there does seem to be a theme going here, where you can have read receipts now in the chat. And they accomplish this with little tiny icons that you'll see over in my example here on the left side next to each particular entry. Now, when somebody requests read receipts on emails, I turn that sucker off every time. You don't get to know when I read your email. However, I kind of like it here because I like to know if I've thrown something out there, has everybody seen it and had a chance to weigh in on it? Uh, I realize that's the same argument that you can make for email, but that's different and it's me. So, hey, <laughs> but here in Microsoft Teams, <clears throat> what happens is when you uh, put a message out there, when it first goes out, you get the little check icon that you see in the lower right corner. And that basically means that it's been sent and it's out there for everybody to look at. Once everybody has seen it, it changes to an eyeball icon. If you hover over the icon um, eyeball, a little pop-up comes up that says seen by everyone. So it kind of gives you a verbal indicate or a text indication of what's happening. If you hover over the check mark one, it just says sent. So those are basically what happens on those. Now for this particular feature, when it was rolled out, there's three different settings that the admins for your particular tenant can set up. By default, it's set to be user preference, which means the user can turn it on, the user can turn it off. It's not something that's hard and fast locked down. By default, it's gonna be turned on. So when you see those little icons, that's because the feature's been rolled out they just took the user preference icon or user preference setting for this particular feature, and you can turn it off if you want to. And I'll show you how to do that in just a second. The second option that the admin could take is everyone. And in a case like that, the feature is going to be turned on, and you don't have the option to turn it off. So if that's something that the organization wants to push as a culture thing to let everybody know hey, I put a message out there. I want to know everybody's seen it. They can turn it on and you don't have any other option. Or the admin can just flat out turn it off and you'll never see those icons, even if you want to. So if you have the ability to turn it on and off, they've gone with the user preference setting, which gives you the option to do your settings. Now, if you're seeing those and you don't want them or you want to see if you can turn them off, in Teams, go up to the upper right corner where you see your little icon picture. Go down to Settings. And if you go to Set, whoops, if you go to Settings, <laughs> and under Privacy, if you have Read Receipts, if you can turn that on and off, then yes, you have the ability to make a choice as to what you want to see. In my case, I don't pay too much attention to it when I'm in chats that have like 20, 30, 40 people in them on an ongoing basis. But I love it when it's a chat with my team that's three people. So if I put something out there for our little group, I can always check the eyeball icon to see, hey, everybody's seen it. I can go ahead and do whatever it was that I was going to do that I let them know I was going to do. But I wanted them to have a chance to say, don't do that. You're going to break something. So this is a really nice feature. It's not a big deal. And to me, invasion of my privacy is not a big deal, Tom. Not to me, it's not. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Well, so, Tom, I've actually so so two questions that I've seen, and there's been some conversations out in a couple communities, uh, Facebook community. Uh, there was a conversation about that feature. Um, first, if you have multiple people, and so it, it, you don't see the eyeball, so not everybody has read it. Is there a way for you to go in and see who has not read it? I uh, see. Not all have seen the chat. You can hover over it, click the ellipsis, and see who has or hasn't. Apparently, Rhiannon Johnson says yes. If you click over the ellipsis, you can. Yeah. I did not know that. Thank you. Yep. And the other one that people asked was, well, we could do this within chat, 
What about within, is Microsoft going to do something similar, read receipts in the conversations like on channels? And the answer for Microsoft is no. That's not the intent of that, of that, chat, that conversation. If you want to know whether people have read something, it was unfortunately, what are your, your, your outlets for that is to have a poll or, you know, or, or, or ask specific people whether they've you know, followed up. But it's, that's just, that's not the place for that kind of functionality. Um, within a chat, um, which is, it's going to be a smaller subset. You're not going to have, you know, 150 people in a chat necessarily. That's going to be more in the thread discussion or in a meeting. Um, you know, so it, it, it's just different use cases there. So, um, but that's my understanding is Microsoft has no plans to add that into the channel discussion. That's just a chat feature. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's one where people were asking about this for a while. Um, and uh, I know I like, like you with email, I see those read receipts and I, I turn that off. I just, I don't, you know, I, I don't play that game, but exactly. Uh, uh, but then again, I'm an independent, you know, maybe it's the policy in your organization for those things. I, I likely would not. And I remember specifically not turning that off when my manager was sending me a message with a read receipt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's some things that are you not exactly yeah, let that one go through career limiting moves there. All right. I'm going to end the poll here. Been over a minute here. And that is, I won with 56%. Very good. Right, that was closer. Okay, so I'm going to have to make this one count because I need to take the next two. <clears throat> so trimming videos directly in Microsoft Teams. This is something that's really cool. I love Microsoft or Teams Stream. <laughs> I love Microsoft Stream. It's the video sharing platform that Microsoft has in Office 365, kind of like their version of YouTube. One of the things is you can record a video, but you can't do a whole lot with it once it's out there. So this particular feature allows you to trim a video that you've loaded to Microsoft Stream, which can help if you've got a bunch of babble at the front that you didn't want to have as part of the recording, or if you've got a bunch of white dead space at the end that you want to get rid of to trim it down. So here's how it works. In this particular uh, example I have here, I've got a video that runs 52 minutes. Uh, everything is looking just fine here. But what I can do is I can click on the ellipsis for this video and I have an option for trim video. And when I click that, it takes the video and it gives me these little handles, which you'll see in the lower left corner and you'll see in the lower right corner so that you can, you know, trim off part of the front end if you need to, trim off some of the back end. You may need to look at the video and get your time sequences down so you know you know, what time spot that you want to cut these off of because it's not really helpful to move these things back and forth for little tiny, tiny, minute chunks of things. But keep in mind that one of the things people ask for in this is, oh, well, I've got like five minutes in the middle I want to take out. This doesn't work for that. It's only for trimming things on the front end and the back end. So basically what you can do at this point is I just went ahead and <clears throat> reduce the video down to about 14 minutes by cutting off the first X number of minutes and cutting off the last X number of minutes to give me something shorter for example purposes. And then once I have that, I have apply up in the left corner. And it'll basically say, just so you know, you're going to permanently change this video uh, if you've added a, a Microsoft form survey or something like that, you may need to readjust it because it's not going to adjust that automatically. So keep that in mind if you've done some of those kind of features to it, but you are going to permanently change the video. And so once you click OK there, it's like it's being trimmed. It's going to be updated soon. You can leave it here or you can hit refresh. It'll take a few minutes. And once that's done, it will basically say, hey, the video's been updated. You can watch the update if you want to now. But if you go back to the list of videos or look at the video itself, you'll see that it's now down to that 14 minutes. And so again, this is nice in the fact that you don't have to take the video out of stream, do some stuff with it, re-upload it. If you want to get something out of the middle, yeah, you're going to have to do that. But 
this makes it to where you can get a lot cleaner videos out there on the front end and the back end if you had stuff there that you really didn't want to have part of the uh, part of the recording that people are going to see. So again, I think this is a nice usability feature for Microsoft Stream. And if you haven't used it, uh, definitely give it a shot. I so wish I could talk about some stuff that's coming up, but I, but I can't. <laughs> it's a really cool capability. Uh, One of these days, I will get to be an MVP, and I will get to know those cool things that I can't tell anybody about. You know, I, I'm, I'm so gun-shy and being careful on not saying that. And because while you were talking, I was going and looking to see – Wait, am I remember? Is is any of this talked about out there? Like, no, none of it's public. Dang it! Uh, I so. could so give him some cool context here. Yeah. Uh, all right. So next one, uh, quick and short, but very cool. Uh, this is more of the automation stuff. Absolutely love this this capability. No move. Is the PowerPoint Presenter Coach? <clears throat> yes. Um, really cool feature. Um, so let me just say what, what it is. It's exactly what you think it is. Uh, it'll actually, um, while you are you go in, you practice, you talk to, so talk to the, 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 the presentation as you're flipping through the slides. And it actually goes in and with the artificial intelligence, it captures your voice and your, the slide movement and with the builds and provides feedback on the presentation your ums and ahs, all the pregnant pauses in there. Um, it, it uh, Just like that. I did that for the presentation purposes. <laughs> and then provide you stats on this. So if you know that you only have 15 minutes for this presentation and you have something like 127 slides, for those that know Richard Harbridge, that's the real world for him. Uh, that's how he presents normally in 15 minutes, like 100 slides. It's only a slight exaggeration there. Uh, however, providing you data back there, it's fantastic. Now, just to be clear, this is through PowerPoint for the web, and it's still in preview, but it's out there. You can go play with it now. So you have your license has the web versions. Most uh, licenses have that. If you have uh, E3 uh, or, or E5, you'll have that. Uh, I believe the F1 products, the frontline uh, F1, F3 also have access to the web versions of these things, but go take a look there. Um, uh, but it's something that you can go and, uh, you know, as you're creating new content, it'll actually give you suggestions that you're building that content, sort of like the ideas, uh, as well as the ability to go in and, uh, and give you feedback on, uh, on a built presentation and as you're actually recording that or as you're, you're building that content and want to present it and say, does this make sense? Is, is this flow? Is my, you know, too much text, too many visualizations and then give you data back on that. And it's pulling some of this data across you know, other presentations and uh, you know, other patterns that it sees from what other people do. Obviously it's not sharing data. It's not, uh, you know, sharing anything that you're uh, uploading or reviewing uh, outside of your organization or even within your organization. It's all personal, but it's pulling data and best practices across all of those other data sets. Bottom line, <clears throat> this is one of the coolest features that Microsoft has come out with like a very, very long time. <laughs> you know, I, um, I said this, uh, we've talked about this in the past, but some of the, the coolest features that Microsoft is doing are all the AI based. If yeah. you're starting to look, when we talk about productivity, you know, if we don't even have, if we don't have at least a couple features that are, you know, AI based, then Tom, you and I are not doing our job. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. This is, this is one of those things that I haven't used it yet because I haven't done I really haven't done too many sit down, do a full presentation, like 30 minutes or an hour or something like that because um, of migration stuff and vacation, things like that. But to me, this is one of the coolest tips that exists. Uh, I just think it's so cool that they can tell you your pace. Are you going to finish on time? Yep. You know, hey, use the words, you know, you guys mm, may not want to use you guys, maybe you all. You know, or like that was brain dead because you showed that in your example. 
yeah, don't use the word brain dead, okay? Yep. Those are things that are just so invaluable that people are thinking, well, that's just the way I talk. You're going to need to change the way you talk. You know, so, that's, that's actually a great point, Tom. What I haven't tested out uh, is like the, one of the tips that you shared a year ago. In fact, it, it was in your list of items from the, the, the SharePoint conference last year. Um, was the, uh, the, the language edits like mm, yes in word. Yeah. And I wonder if it, if it follows the same capabilities, that's, that would I be would an interesting guess pr point. probably pretty close. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, this uh, y'all sure, need to be post. voting for this one. <laughs> it's just all there is oh. to it. This is cool. I'll end the poll here. We're at, uh, as we get to the last one and yeah, I won that one 73%. So <laughs> you should, thank should you have been even more, but yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And Douglas said, uh, I hope they made a hefty donation to Toastmasters. Yeah, it, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, think they, I think that they have, they have tapped into the collective unconscious of Toastmasters. For there the, you go. Uh, there you go. Trekking those pregnant pauses there. Okay. Right. Well, you're going to win this session, so why don't you go to round five and see if you can right. absolutely toast me here. One more that I absolutely love, and it has a short demo, so I'll uh, hopefully it'll work with the webinar running because it uses the microphone, but we'll give it a try here. And that is the new improved dictation in Word. And of course, it's already there. There's the dictation that's been around for a while, but they've gone in and made it smarter. Uh, and I, I actually had my text, I removed it. My first line said, this period, absolutely period, rocks, period. <laughs> so I was playing with it. It was actually was telling my, my uh, daughter who's in the, works for Regent, Regents Hospital in, there in Minneapolis, and, and my son who's down south of me here um, uh, that are, are, uh, was sharing like, hey, you guys need to go and play with this. It is fantastic. Um, so the, I was just amazed at how accurate it was. Now, I'm still trying to figure out some of the hot keys for punctuation, but if you're writing a, a lot of content like I do, uh, and let me share this, let me attempt this um, just to show you. So it's really simple here, new clean Word doc, just you go up to dictate, and what it does, it turns on the microphone, starts recording, and we'll see how accurate it is. Now, there, it'll be without punctuation. You can add, like, pause and say comma or period for those things. Or you can sit there with your fingers on period or the, uh, the return to, uh, to hit the next line. But even having one flowing free flow of paragraph of text and, and be able to sit there and speak it versus write it is just fantastic. So let me just turn that on. Hello, everybody. Period. There we go. And of course, everything that I say will come out. And uh, let me try something a little more complicated. Uh, uh, or as Tom says, oh man, this tip is going to absolutely crush my next tip. Period. Actually, you're right, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll turn turn that off there. As you can see, how accurate that was. It didn't used to be this accurate. <laughs> uh, so what's great about this is, uh, so it's out. It's in Outlook as well as I started using this in Word. Um, it's like a lot of people. Like I, I, I type with. I, I, I never took a typing class in high school, uh, so I type with five fingers. Uh, I can type about probably about 60, 70 words a minute. Um, fairly accurate, but my mind moves much quicker than I'm able to type and to be able to sit and, uh, and just dictate and write content this way is just fantastic. So I'm a fan, not save that, close it down. Very cool little feature. Definitely a very cool little feature. And if this were a golf game, I would just say, I'm just going to do a pick up my ball and give you this <laughs> round without even <laughs> presenting here. But just to keep it fair, <clears throat> uh, let me get to you. So my last tip and the tip that will get smoked by the one he just gave us is again, a Microsoft stream um, tip, but it's allowing you to use the same URL for a replacement uh, video. So this could be a situation where 
you may have like five HR videos that you want everybody to use and you need to go refresh at the end of the year, but you really don't want to have all new URLs that you have to go figure out where were all the links placed, the whole bit. This feature allows you to put that new video in the same URL space as a video that already exists. So you don't have to change any of your documentation, any of your links that you've got out there. It's just now they'll click on the link and they'll go to the new video that you have out there, which is really cool. That's a so, really important update. Yeah. So this is a continuation using this, uh, the last example that I had where I had the test trimming video that I brought down to like 14 minutes from the 50 some odd minutes that we had out there. And it's got this URL attached at the bottom, but I'd like to put the old video back out there, but I don't want to have to replace all the different places where it's pointed to. So now if I go out there and I click on the ellipsis icon, in addition to the trim video, I also have an option to replace the video. And if I click on that, it'll say I can drag the video up here to the slot where it says browse to upload or drag video. It will tell you the things that'll be deleted, the things that will be disconnected, such as forms like we talked about last time, but it will also save view counts, details, options, permissions, things like that. So you might want to look at that and go, yeah, do I have to do any you know, tweaking of thumbnails or is there a caption file I have to work with, things like that. But you do have the ability, again, to place it in the same slot. So in this case, I'm going to take my original video that was like 52 minutes long, drag it into this particular thing. So I've got my test replacement video. Go ahead and click replace. And then what's going to happen is it's going to pop up my normal screen that I would see when I upload a video, but it's going to tell me it's editing the test trimming video. Now it's uploading the test replacement video into that spot. And now it's replacing the whole uh, video. So it's going to be overlaying. And when I get done, now when I look at it in my list of videos for this particular uh, channel, it's actually out there with a 52 minute video again, URL is exactly the same. So this isn't something that you would use like every day, but if you've got a significant part of your company or processes that are using videos that need to be updated on a regular basis and they're linked to from various places, this is a lifesaver in terms of being able to update content without having to update a dozen pages and having broken links that you know you forgot to touch. So cool tip, not as cool as the one that Christian just presented. So throw that voting up there and we'll call this a good session. <laughs> well, I would say that, you know, they, they added a really cool capability and yet they still didn't fix those hideously ugly URLs. <laughs> they are ugly. They really, really are ugly. No, you know, this is, uh, uh, so, I mean, I know it's a completely different thing, but like when they, uh, so SlideShare, which I've used for a good part of a decade, and they removed that ability to uh, swap out videos, uh, you know, just as the pain in the butt where, you know, if you find that, uh, like I've uploaded versions of this where I have just like, oh, you know what, we, I, we made modifications to something, some slides. I have to go and I've already shared it out. I've already had 50 people review it. And now I've got to yeah. delete that one, point people to a new changed link. Super annoying. So how much did you win this round by? Um, four more seconds, three. Christian, that other guy? <laughs> Just that other guy now? <laughs> I personalized it. Yeah, I won that one 76%. Wait, I have one more question for everybody before we leave here. Let me launch this poll. I'm going to allow the panelists to vote as well. <laughs> <laughs> And this is why I hit below the belt, Christian. That's all there is to it. <laughs> this is why I hit below the belt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is what I put up with people Wait, to do this. Two people, every single two people month. are admitting, Tom, that you paid them. <laughs> well, I was one of them. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm gonna end. I'll end that. That just okay. I just wanted to have some data, some proof. You know, there. There you go. There, there, you there go. we go. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, thanks for voting on that. Uh, so overall winner uh, I took today. So thank you very yes, much, you everybody, did. for voting on that. Congrats. And, very uh, good tips. Tom and I will be back for the April FLUX on yes. April 22nd. Cool. Uh, 
what does that word mean? I don't know. I'd have to go look it up again, but it's like, yeah, I was going to say, I have to go look it up either. Cause I don't have a clue as to what it means. Yeah, in context I, for this. I knew it one time. And then I thought of a completely different, uh, so I know what August is going to be now. Um, so, uh, August acrimony. Ooh, I like it. Yeah. So anyway, so join us on April 22nd when we'll do this again, uh, uh for everyone. Yes. The recording will be live later tonight. I'll have this up on the Buckley Planet blog, which will link to the recording, to the slides, so you can download all of those, get all the links, all the information. Uh, and there's also, if you've not checked it out, if you go to Buckley Planet, up in the top in the nav, click on Productivity Tips, and that will take you to every single one of our recordings and all of our slides. And there are hot links to the timestamps within each video. So if you only care about that tip in the middle of the video, you can jump right to it. So Sounds good. Thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next month. Thanks a lot. See you later, Tom. Bye.